I'm going to start with this first picture. Uh, I think it's up. Yes. Anybody know who this is? David, you, does anybody know who sculpted this? Michelangelo, Michelangelo right. Okay, so most people know that Michelangelo, uh, one of the great Renaissance sculptors, uh, made this out of a huge block of marble, and it's uh, somewhere around 19 feet tall or something like that. Uh, it's pretty, pretty big. Um, uh, and uh, this next one, uh, let's see, this is the Sist- part of the Sistine Chapel. This is a huge, anybody ever go to, has anybody seen the Sistine Chapel? Like, really, you've seen it? How, I mean, it's pretty big, right? It's huge, right? And, uh, and so this is like the centerpiece, and we all kind of know this picture, um, you know, throughout history. It's become one of the iconic pictures, one of the greatest artists has ever made, uh, ever. And so, uh, so Michelangelo is known by his masterpieces. In fact, I would say we wouldn't even know who Michelangelo was if we didn't have his, his art to, to look at. Amen. And, uh, and so the goal of every artist, is, do we have any artists, anybody paint, anybody sculpt or anything, anybody? Yeah, a few? Yeah, okay, cool, very good. Uh, the goal of every artist is to have a masterpiece, is to have something that he's known by. After he dies, long after he's dead, like people will know his name for centuries because of the masterpiece that he's made. And without these masterpieces, we wouldn't know who these people are. But, but here's the deal. Um, this type of, let's go back to the first picture, um, uh, this type of sculpture wasn't the first of its kind. Uh, years before Michelangelo, uh, another Ninja Turtle named Donatello um, <laughs> created another statue of David. Let's go ahead and put that one up there. And uh, this is the statue. This is more of a bronze of David, more as a young man. I didn't want to show the whole thing of either one of them for uh, obvious reasons. Uh, <clears throat> didn't feel like it would be good to do in church. So I just kind of took the top half of their body. Uh, but on this one, he's standing on Goliath's head after it's been severed with Goliath's own sword. How cool is that? And Donatello created this one. And he was before Michelangelo. And what's interesting about this is that they're enough different that, um, that you can tell that they were made by different people, but they're enough alike that you can tell that one of them trained the other one. Here's the only problem. Donatello died nine years before Michelangelo was ever born, so this is impossible. So there's no way that Donatello could have trained Michelangelo in the old Renaissance art. Has anybody ever heard of the name Bertoldo Giovanni? Anybody? We got one guy. All right. This is some of Giovanni's work. Uh, This is a coin that he made. Uh, This guy was a master at doing very fine, I mean, we're talking very small very small art, and he would, he would create, that's what he was kind of known for, uh, but, but not many people actually know who Giovanni was. Giovanni was Donatello's apprentice. In fact, Don, Donatello liked this guy so much, and he was so, uh, Giovanni was so good, that Donatello let Giovanni finish a lot of his works. He would start them, and they'd be like, all right, Giovanni, you can, you're so good, you can finish off this work here. And so he had let Giovanni finish a lot of his work. But Giovanni really didn't like doing sculptures as much as he liked doing these coins. And uh, that was really his thing. But here's the thing. He would never be known by that. Only obscure artists and and people who understand a lot about Renaissance art would know his name or even recognize this piece of work. He wasn't really known by his masterpieces. Uh, These are called relief carvings, medalists, that kind of of thing. Uh, But see... Giovanni, here's, here's the thing about Giovanni. Giovanni took this young boy under his wing named Michelangelo. Now you're seeing it. And he poured all of this wisdom, all of his artistic wisdom, all of his knowledge, all that he had ever had from Donatello, he took and he passed it on to Michelangelo. He poured everything he had into that boy. He was with him all the time and showed him all the ways. So much so that when Michelangelo would create his masterpiece of David, Artists around the world to this day would say he must have been trained by Donatello, even though Donatello had died nine years before Michelangelo was even born. Giovanni wouldn't be known by his works of art. He had no real masterpiece to speak of that the world would know his name by. On the other hand, one might say that that Michelangelo was his masterpiece. Michelangelo was Giovanni's masterpiece. Now, which masterpiece is better? I don't know. Big idea today or this morning is what is your masterpiece or, or rather who is your masterpiece? Something very foundational happened in my life. I, I came to church. I grew up in church, great church, Assembly God Church in Perryton, Texas. 
And um, it's a great church. Pastor, would, man, he would bring fire every single week. It was so amazing. Um, but I remember I would sit on the front pew, and man, I was on fire for God at, at one point in my life. After I'd finished running from God, I was like, okay, I'm ready to do this thing. And, and it was like, there's a lot of really great theories going out, but like, I didn't know exactly how to follow Christ. I didn't know exactly how to stop sinning or, or what I was supposed to do, or I kind of knew, but it was more of an instruction kind of thing. And it's like, go and win the, win the world of Christ. And I'm like, yay, How? But I did not. I'll just get up and go, okay, I'll go try to save the world. I didn't know what I was doing. And so this, the pastor asked me to come preach. I had no idea that I was going to become a preacher. And I'm like, okay, I'll preach. And so I tried to get out of it, but I, I ended up preaching my first sermon. And uh, it was the day that my girlfriend had broken up with me that I was to preach a sermon on strength, which is really interesting, <laughs> that my strength is made perfect, or his strength is made perfect in our weakness. And I was like, oh, God, this is some big joke. And... Uh, I preached this sermon, it was broken, it was messed up, but it was, it, you know, it, something came alive in me that, that day when I preached. And uh, the next week, this older man in the congregation walked up to me and handed me this tape, this John Maxwell tape, and, uh, and said, man, there's this kid on here at the end of the, 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 this teaching, this guy is talking about this kid, and this kid reminds me of you. And he's like, man, I was so blown away by your sermon. It was so great. I'm so glad that this young man, you're a young man and you're serving God and you're doing things for the Lord. And man, I just applaud you. Here's this tape. I want you to listen to it and see what you think. Man, I went right home. I popped it in there. I don't remember what the teaching was about, but I remember how I felt. That there was an older man in the congregation that had nothing to do with me, but, but took time to have something to do with me. Over time, this man would, 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 would ask me how things were going in life, and, and he would make his way to me uh, across the room every time we'd have church, and he'd shake my hand. And, and then he would start taking me out to Cokes, and, and we would drink Coke, and, and we would talk uh, about life, and we would talk about Jesus, and we would talk about leadership. And, and I would ask him questions, and he would listen to my stories, and it was always so encouraging and uh, um, it was just, he would, he would teach me how to lead my friends to Christ. I, I actually began to mentor my friends around me because this man took time to pour into my life. And uh, I would lead my friends to Jesus, and I, I was like, I feel like I'm too young to mentor them. Some of them are older than me. And I started mentoring these kids around me <laughs> and basically becoming their pastor and showing them how to do things. And as time has gone on, those, those apprentices have gotten younger and younger, but... Um, and I thank God. Uh, but, uh, you know, he would, he would show me and, and, and he would believe in me and created me into the man I believe that I am today because of it. And one, one day, him and two other guys in our congregation uh, uh, had a rite of passage for us. And so uh, we lived out in the country and, and we were supposed to go out on this journey. And we went on this journey, me and my friends that I'd led to the Lord. We called ourselves the Four Horsemen. <laughs> and uh, we, we, we went out and, and down in this creek bed was, was my Royal Ranger leader. And Royal Rangers, uh, for those of you guys who know Assembly of God, is kind of like uh, Boy Scouts for Assembly of God. And there he talked about what it meant to be a man. Um, and, and then we went into another place and, and there my dad was. And he talked about another piece of... Um, of what it meant to be a man. And, uh, and then we climbed up this mountain, and on top of this mountain uh, was this man uh, that had been mentoring me. And he was there with my sword. And uh, there he talked about what it meant to be a spiritually to be a man and to grow up and become a man of God. And all these men surrounded us, prayed over us, and they knighted us. And I know that sounds kind of goofy in our day and age. What does that even mean? It means that somebody took time to believe in me. And, it, and that catapult, all I needed was somebody to believe in me. I, didn't, I, I needed someone to give me permission to serve God, someone to say, you can do this, somebody to, to, to take me from, from, from Donatello to, to Michelangelo, somebody that would take what they had learned and pass it on to me. And uh, <laughs> a few years later, I would get down on one knee and I would ask his daughter to marry me. And uh, Dennis Warren changed my life. He, he mentored me. He made me into the man that I am today. There's two other people, my mom, Dennis, and my, my youth pastor, Sally. That, that without them, I would not be the man of God that I am today. And my, my question to you today is this, who is your masterpiece? See, the pastor never told him to go out and find me and take me out for a Coke. The pastor never told him to do that. He just, on his own volition, saw something in a young man, and he gave himself away to this young man. 
And it's changed hundreds of lives now. We started, I, I began to mentor young men as I grew up. And, and, and like I said, I, I always have a group of young men around me that I'm pouring my life into. And, 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 and if, I, if you were to ask me what my ministry is about, you might say, yeah, there's 150 people that meet at our worship service on Tuesday night. But I would tell you the most important time of my week is Friday from 2 to 5 in the coffee shop where I'm sitting there with a group of about five or six guys. Some of them are sitting here today. And I'm giving my life to them. I'm pouring everything I've got out to them. That is the most important thing I can do in my ministry. And I, I would say it's the most important thing you can do in your ministry as well. Yes, you all have ministries. You are all mentors. You all know so much. And you don't know everything. And I didn't either. But you have so much to give. I've learned so much from my pastor growing up, but my training would have been severely incomplete if Dennis hadn't taken me and poured his life into me. And when I think about the church and I see the average age, at least in the Methodist church, and many others I've been a part of, I wonder what the fate of the church in America is. And, and, and I'm going to tell you, the answer is not getting bigger church services. The answer isn't to get bigger membership and more enrollment and, and more people involved in, in, in programs. That's not the answer. That's the answer. If you want to look at the answer, just look at the, the four Gospels. The first half is big ministry. The second half is almost completely pulling backwards into mentoring these 12 guys so that they, whenever Jesus dies, they've got it and you got 12 Jesuses running around. In fact, in fact, he almost spends no time with anybody else out after that second half of, of each of the four Gospels. You can take them all and divide them in half. It's, it's him saying, no, you guys got to really get this because I'm about to go. So, you know, we think if, if we only had about 10, 10 you know, weeks left, we'd want to go out and reach as many people as we could for Christ, Right? That's not what Jesus does. As he nears the cross, instead of trying to find as many people as he can, he finds those few and he trains them really good so that they're complete whenever he leaves this world. And so I pose this question. When did we decide to start making disciples on an assembly line? When did we start thinking that maybe, you know, the, the, the big Billy Graham crusades was the way to go? Because I guarantee you nobody gets discipled through that. They might get one to Christ, but nobody gets discipled. It would be like having children, like a bunch of kids, and just leaving them out on the street. Spiritually, it's no different. We're expecting people to survive without mentoring them. We have to mentor them, and we can't do it in a huge class setting. We have to do it one-on-one, -on -one, life on life, one-on-five -on -five or 12 or whatever. But it can't be, it can't be, we can't be trying to spread the gospel through huge crowds because it won't stick. I believe it with all of my heart. We can't make disciples on an assembly line. We have to make them handmade that's why Taylor guitars and the higher price guitars are handmade and the lower price $100, $200 guitars are like made on an assembly line. We have to make disciples. We have to pass on our knowledge, our wisdom, and our ways to the next generation. There's an African poet named Amado Hampate, and we'll throw that up there. And he says, when an old man is dying, it's as if a whole library is burning. Think about that. When an old man is dying, it's as if a whole library is burning. When I moved on to college and I wasn't around Dennis as much, I was looking for a mentor, and I would ask men to mentor me. I'd say, please, share with me what you got. And we don't, you know what they would tell me? They'd say, oh, I don't, I don't know. I don't know anything. You're, you're further along than I am. And I'm like, you've been sitting in church all this time. You, you, you've been living this life so much, so long. You've got nothing to get. Come on. You're hoarding. You're a hoarder. We're going to bring a, a TV show, a, a van over. We're going to, with camera crews, and show how you're a hoarder of knowledge. You've got to pass on what you've been given. You've got to take it and give it to the next generation because when an old man is dying, it's as if a whole library is burning. And we lose all of that knowledge, all of that wisdom, all of those ways. Paul's writing to the Corinthian church, and he, he's kind of getting on to him in chapter 4. He says, I don't, I don't write these things to shame you. See, they thought they, they knew everything, you know, just like kids do, you know, teenagers and myself, I did as well. And <laughs> I give Dennis so much of a hard time so many times, but uh, we think we know everything. And the younger we are, the more we think we know. And the older we get, we realize we don't know anything. And, um, and so he's like, wow, you guys got it all figured out. I wish you would have invited me. I, I, I would love to learn from you. And he's kind of getting on to him, being sarcastic. And then we get to verse 14. He says, I don't write these things to shame you guys, but as beloved children, I warn you. Paul has enough of a relationship with this Corinthian church to be able to warn them. They're not a bunch of snowflakes, you know. 
which means he's close enough to them to warn them that they have a relationship, a ship that has been built strong enough to hold the weight of warning. But how? The next verse tells us. Verse 15. For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. He's talking about spiritual fatherhood. He's like, you can have 10,000 instructors. You can listen to so many podcasts. You can have so many, you know, uh, you know, you can listen to John Bevere. Man, that guy can teach, right? And you can listen to, you know, Rick Warren, and you can listen to all these people. You know, they got so much good stuff to say. You can have so many instructors, but you're going to be incomplete if you don't have spiritual fathers. And a lot of times we won't be a spiritual father to people because we think, well, John Bevere's got it better, and maybe you should just listen to him, and I don't really have anything to say. Man, I'm all jacked up. I mean, I'm still dealing through my stuff and everything. It doesn't matter. You don't have to teach what you don't know, but you got to take what you got and give it to the next generation. So when I couldn't find a mentor, I was like, I'll just be the mentor I, I couldn't find. And so I just started taking men, and I messed up a lot along the way, and I would tell them. I would apologize. I would tell them, man, I messed up there, guys. I'm so sorry. It's a vulnerable place to be a mentor because you get, they're looking into your life. They're looking into your soul. They're looking into your mistakes. And they're like, man, I would have done that better. And you're like, yeah, I would have too if I would have known better. But giving yourself away as a spiritual father doesn't mean that you're perfect. It doesn't mean that you got it all together. You got all the answers. But you've got something to give. Amen? He says, though you might have 10,000 instructors, in Christ, yet you don't have many fathers. What does that mean? I mean, I could go all day, and, but, but you already know there's a difference between an instructor and a father. An instructor has all the answers. The father is, 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 but is, is intimately with you wherever you go. They're with you from birth all the way through in theory. Verse 16, he says, therefore I urge you. Now, this is a big, bold statement. Imitate me. You want to know how to follow Christ? Do what I do. Wow. Man, that's, that's intense. Does anybody, I mean, does anybody else want to say that? I mean, you know, but that's why we don't have mentors. Because we, we don't got many people that are willing to say, yeah, I don't got the answers, but go ahead and imitate me and we'll, we'll figure it out as we go. You know, we want to have it all perfect and look real shiny and everything look good. But he says, go ahead and imitate me. And, and you know, Paul even got, he did some stuff. You know, he got upset and all kinds of things that he didn't do everything perfect, but he says, imitate me. You want to know how to live this life for Christ? Follow me. Do what I do. You want to know how to make a Donatello? Follow me. <clears throat> Paul is like a father to the people of God, not just an instructor. He sees his position in the church. He sees his position in the church more as a father, someone who's deeply invested. And this seems to be the way of learning from the most ancient of times. Uh, if we go to 1 Kings uh, we even look into the Old Testament. That's the New Testament. Let's look in the Old Testament. First Kings 19 um, is where Elijah is about to appoint his successor. And God says, uh, you know, you're getting older. It's time for you to pass the torch on to the next generation. And he says, then Elijah passed by Elisha, and he threw his mantle on him. And a mantle was a really important thing. Uh, it was like his cloak, you know. You know, Jewish scholars would say you could see uh, somebody walking, you know, a prophet walking from way down the street. You could see the, his his cloak, and you would know that was Elijah because of his cloak. You know, it's like that's Elijah. I can tell by the way he walks. You know, that, that that's Elijah, and that I can tell by his his cloak, his mantle. That's Elijah. He took his mantle, his his ways, his ideas, his essence. And, and, he, and he throws it on Elisha, and he just keeps on walking. I think it's a hilarious story. It's a symbolic statement that as a father clothes his son, now I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to instruct you. I'm going to raise you. I'm going to show you the way. I will be your spiritual father. When, so when did we drop this ancient art of apprenticeship? And what would it take to change this now? I mean, we're almost becoming a post-Christian nation. Things are getting crazy. In my, in my work, people are still, there's people that don't know who Noah is. I'm a college minister, right? So there's a lot of people that didn't grow up in the church anymore. I'm finding more and more, even in West Texas, people that weren't, didn't grow up in church, they don't know these stories. So we're becoming a post-Christian nation. Is it too late? Is it too late to save the world? I would say No but we're going to have to do it different. Instead of running fast after somebody, like having an arrow in your hand and running at your enemy, we're going to have to take a second to draw backwards and pull in and disciple. And when it's aimed just right, right into the heart of the enemy, 
That's how we're going to win this war, but we're not going to win it with big, large meetings. That's going to help. That's going to be a part of it, but we've got to start mentoring or we're going to lose the war. I believe it deeply. Um, I tried to learn karate. We got uh, karate, right? Uh, I tried to learn karate from a book. Uh, I, I thought, oh, this is going to be awesome. I, I got a book from the library, and I, I, look, I'm, I, don't know what I'm, I don't know what I'm doing. You can't, I'm sorry, but you can't learn karate from the book. This isn't the Matrix, you know, you can't just plug in and, and just have no kung fu. Like, you have to have someone over years show you and demonstrate and, and mentor you, and you have to be their apprentice to the sensei, Right? Uh, Before you can learn karate, you need demonstration to learn how to walk this life of faith by somebody who's further down the road. Titus 2 talks all about it. I encourage you to read it when you get home. Uh, It says, older men in the congregation, not the pastor, older men in the congregation, teach the younger men. Teach them how to be sober. That's interesting. Teach them how to be sober. Teach them how to be reverent. What does that mean? How to have sound faith and doctrine, what to believe, because your belief determines your behavior. How to love people, how to be patient. And older women... It says a lot of the same things. Don't be a gossip or teach them how to not be gossips um, and not to be given to wine. And then it says this, older women need to teach the younger women how to love their husbands. Isn't that interesting? I thought, wow, you don't see that a lot in some churches. I don't know if this church might, uh, but, you know, like the older ladies taking the younger ladies and showing them how to do stuff, you know, And, and part of that, how to love their husbands. I think that's just interesting. We have to pass on what we know. Um, in these times with my guys on Fridays, uh, you know, we'll be, I'll be teaching them through some stuff, and I'll be listening to their life, and so it's this big mixture of stuff. And then at one point every week or every couple of weeks, I'll lean in and say, gentlemen, it's almost like the Holy Spirit tells me to tell them something. When you get married one day, and they, everybody le- leans in, their eyes widen, and they're, they're ready, and, they, and I just give them something, you know, something, some bit of wisdom so that when they get older one day, they'll, they'll know. Um, This is what the ancient Jewish culture called a yoke. Someone say yoke. A yoke is uh, basically uh, you would have, uh, well, I'll explain it. In the Jewish culture, uh, back in the days that Jesus was inserted into history, children began their study at five in a thing called Beth Sefer. Beth Sefer. And uh, this is where they would memorize the 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 first five books of the Bible. From age five to about age ten. They would be memorizing Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Does anybody have that memorized here today, by the way? Um, nobody? Yeah, me neither. Um, but they were, by age 10, they would have this thing memorized. And the best of the best would move on to, e- to either Beth Midrash, or they would go home and study their family trade, like fishing or carpentry or whatever. And Beth Midrash, they would memorize the rest of the Old Testament all the way through Malachi. Now they have it memorized. Now, by the time they're about uh, 17, 18, uh, the, very, the very best would move on and study under a rabbi. Very few people would do this. Everybody else would go study their family business. And they would travel wherever the, the rabbi went. Uh, they would go with the rabbi, and they would become what they would call a Talmud, or in plural, a Talmudim. And so you would see one mentor and like 10 or 12 Talmudim following him around wherever he went, listening to his conversation, listening to how he would teach and, and what he would be doing, how he would interact with his family, how he would do everything that he did because they're with him all the time. This was the mentoring of the Old Testament. And this is the moment that Jesus walked into the world. And this word Talmudim is translated disciple. So when the disciples were called disciples... That's not just some word that came up. It was actually a part of their Jewish culture. It was to be called the Talmud. And they would be, they would be the Talmudim walking with their, apprentice, with, their, with their rabbi wherever they went. And this, this, this relationship was a, a very intense, very personal relationship. And as the rabbi lived and taught his understanding of Scripture, his students or his Talmudim would listen and watch and imitate to become just like him and take on his yoke or his style, his interpretation, his way. And uh, scholar Ray Vanderlyn, I don't know if anybody knows him, he's a really great scholar, uh, quoted an ancient Jewish proverb, and this is what they would say. They would say, follow the rabbi. They would, like, rabbis would, like, say your rabbi and your friend rabbi would come, like, so, so Nathan, his, all his Talmudim would come and would be around my Talmudim. Nathan would say to my guys, be like, hey, listen. They'd lean in and be like, listen, guys. Follow the rabbi, drink in his words, and be covered in the dust of his feet. What? What does that mean? See, that is so foreign to us in our culture. Be covered in his, I'm not covered in no one's dust. I'm my own man. Okay, fine. 
but we're not learning. We're not know, we don't know the stuff like they knew back then, right? And this would be shortened to, may you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. See, they would be walking down these dirty streets, you know, from Damascus to Jerusalem or wherever. And as they're walking, the rabbi's talking, and they're listening, and they're taking notes. And he's talking, and, and, and he's stirring up dust, you know, and, and there's dusty roads, you know. And, and, and you get to the next town, and you're just covered in dust. That means that dust is almost as if you've been covered in that knowledge. You've been covered in that wisdom and that understanding. In that journey, you've been covered in the dust of the rabbi, meaning you are learning what he learned. You're taking on his yoke. When a rabbi would say, uh, so, so after Beth Midrash, when a rabbi would say, follow me, that meant that this rabbi thought that this Talmud had what it took to become just like him. So he says, follow me. So when Jesus goes along and he says to these fishermen and these tax collectors and people, hey, follow me. It's like, what? I've already been rejected. I've already been rejected from this because I didn't know as much as the next guy did, knew to become a rabbi. And now I'm just a fisherman. Here, this, this rabbi saying, follow me. They got up and they followed and they dropped their nets and they went. And as they went, they learned what he was all about. And that's how they were able to write the books that they wrote. Um, <laughs> this is why Peter, when he saw Jesus walking on water, think about this. Did anybody here ever think it's kind of strange? And he's like, hey, have me walk out on water too. Uh, most of us, here, here's the American mindset. Well, that was Jesus. We can't do what Jesus did. That was Jesus. That's the American mindset, right? That was not the Talmud uh, rabbi relationship idea. When Jesus said, follow me to Peter, Peter knew that meant that Peter could do what Jesus did after being fully trained. So when he sees his master out on the water, and, and he's, he's like, Hey, if you're Jesus, you tell me to, to come out there because I can do, because of you, I can do what you do. And he steps out on water. And what's interesting is that Jesus, when, when Peter sinks, what is his, what, what is his uh, reaction to that? It's not like, I knew he was going to sink. It says Jesus was surprised. He's like, Peter, what the heck? You know you can do this. Like, <laughs> he says, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt that I can empower you to be just like me? Why did you doubt that I can empower you to be just like me? And now we have this, this American culture that says, oh, we can never be like Jesus. But Jesus is like, I want you to be just like me. And even greater things will you do than me when you're fully trained. But the gap is Giovanni. We don't have many Giovannis that will take us from Donatello to Michelangelo. Luke 6, 39 through 40 says, everyone who is perfectly trained will be just like his teacher. John 3, 13, 15, for I have given you an example, a tupos, an example that you should do as I have done to you, meaning I trained you, now you go and train somebody else, and that baton goes down to us. Worship team, you can come. So now time passes, and Elijah is mentoring Elisha for a while now. And it's about time for Elijah, the mentor, to go on to heaven. 2 Kings 2.2 says, Then Elijah said to Elisha, Hey, I want you to stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Bethel. But Elisha said this, As the Lord lives and as my soul lives, I will not leave you. It was said that Elisha wouldn't even let Elijah go to the bathroom by himself. Like He's like, I'm not letting you out of my sight. I want to be like you. Elijah rolls up his mantle, and he strikes the water, whoosh, and it parts. And, I, and he turns around, and he asks Elisha, Elisha, what do, you, what do you want? Elisha says, man, I want a double portion of your spirit. And as they're walking... Out of nowhere, this chariot of fire comes and he picks up Elijah, Elijah and Elijah goes up into heaven. And as he's going up into heaven, as he's almost out of sight, he drops his mantle down to Elisha. And Elisha now stands alone holding this symbol of who his mentor was in his hands. And he walks back to the same river that his mentor walked up to and was able to divide. And he walks up to this, this thing and he's like, I don't know if I've got what it takes. My mentor's gone now. And this is the test of Elisha. And Elisha took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him. And he struck the water and he says, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he struck the water, it was divided this way and that. And Elisha crossed over. And guess what? Now when the sons of the prophets who were from Jericho saw him, they said, 
the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And I wonder if Elisha was Elijah's masterpiece. So we look at all the miracles that Elijah was able to do, and we think, wow, that's cool. But I wonder if Elijah would tell you from heaven today that his greatest miracle, the greatest thing he ever did, his greatest masterpiece was Elisha. What's interesting is that Michelangelo's statue of David is about twice the height as Donatello's. It's a double portion. When I think about my boys over here, um, I believe they're a double portion. I wouldn't even get out of my room hardly in Jones Hall, but I would start, I'd start up a ministry. Turok over here, he, he started up the Maroon Platoon and all these crazy things. And he's, um, he had, Facebook told him he had to either become a public figure or get rid of some friends because he had too many friends. <laughs> double portion. Miles here, he's sore right now because out of nowhere, he just decided to donate bone marrow. I don't think I would have ever done that. And, the, and he's a big guy. And uh, so whenever um, the doctor came in, he just told me a minute ago, he said, uh, the doctor looked at him and was like, yeah, I can get about two liters out of you. So, oh my gosh. Two liters of bone marrow? I wouldn't have done that. Double portion. Instead of a copy of a copy of a copy becoming worse, what if through true mentoring and discipleship, it gets better and better and better? And eventually, when a student is fully trained, they'll be just like their master. The great poet Randy Travis once said, (laughs) it's not what you take when you leave this world behind you. It's what you leave behind you when you go. What could happen If the people of the church saw this as their mission, not the pastor's mission, but their mission to find and to say, follow me and to take them and to show them warts and all and disciple them and show them the way. My theme verse for life is 2 Timothy 2.2 and it says, Paul is talking to Timothy. He says, the things which you have have heard from me What are we going to do with this now? Commit this to faithful men who will teach others also. This is four generations. Paul to Timothy to faithful men to others. And it keeps going and it keeps going and it keeps going. So my question for you today is this. Who is your masterpiece? Fathers, spiritual fathers, spiritual mothers. Who is your masterpiece? Two, are you willing to go beyond being an instructor to a father? Instructor is just giving. Father is letting people in. Three, will you share your wisdom before the library burns? It's not too late. Amen? I think we're going to have to do something radical in the church world today if we're going to see this ship turn around. It's too late to keep trying to do mass evangelism. It's time to start taking our Talmud, Talmudim, and and showing them the way. Titus 2 will give you a good clue in how how to do all that. If I had more time, I'd talk more about the how, but most importantly, I wanted to talk about the why and the what. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the fathers in this room, biologically fathers. I also thank you for the spiritual fathers who've raised up young men and young women over time. God, I pray that the things that our mentors have shown us that we would take to faithful men who would then be able to teach others also. That we would become fathers, not just instructors. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand. Lord, I lift up this church to you today. I pray that within this room somewhere, someone may be inspired to say that the most effective thing we can do rather than making these masterpieces that people remember us by is to maybe pour our life into someone. And maybe that's our greatest masterpiece. I pray that would that somebody would take this, 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 this baton that I've handed out today and would just spread and run and grab hold of 
and move out and take time to invest, time that they don't even have to invest in the most investment they could ever make into a young life. God, I pray over this church, bless them. 